billions of dollars in federal funding, four new heritage units, Amtrak expansion plans, and a bull running loose on the train tracks, all coming up now on Railroad Quarterly. Hello and welcome back to Railroad Quarterly, my video series covering news in the railroad industry here in North America. Today we'll be recapping the past few months beginning at the end of 2023 and transitioning into the first months of the new year. Let's jump right in. All the way back in November, on the 29th, Chicago Commuter Rail Metra placed its first ST-70s into service. Since late 2022, Metra has been taking delivery to a fleet of former ST-70 MAC freight locomotives rebuilt to passenger specifications by Progress Rail. Though Metra is no stranger to six-axle passenger units, it's one of only two railroads in the country operating such massive engines on passenger trains. On the 1st of December, the port of Woodland, Washington, and a small startup known as Glide, announced their plans to start testing an autonomous road-to-rail vehicle later this year. These so-called gliders will move containers in and around the yard and could see more use elsewhere in the future. Stay tuned for more in-depth video on this. On the 4th, after sitting on a freight siding in Millbury, Massachusetts for almost half a decade, former New Haven FL9 number 2027 was moved to Cape Cod to be restored and used on the Cape Cod Central Railroad. 2027 was purchased in 2018 by the Boston Surface Railroad, which planned to start a commuter rail service between Providence, Rhode Island and Concord, New Hampshire. After declaring bankruptcy in 2019, 2027 continued to deteriorate and was mildly vandalized, but now it's being restored to its former glory, joining two similar FL9s on the Cape. On the same day, St. Louis Metrolink placed an order for up to 55 Siemens S200 light rail vehicles to replace 30-year-old SD400 cars. The first of these cars will arrive in 2026. On the 5th, the Federal Railroad Administration identified a total of 14 potential inner-city rail routes, giving each a $500,000 grant for viability studies and planning. The corridors are as follows. Asheville to Salisbury, North Carolina. Charlotte, North Carolina to Washington, D.C. Charlotte, North Carolina to Atlanta, Georgia. Charlotte to Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Fayetteville to Raleigh, North Carolina. Wilmington to Raleigh, North Carolina. Winston-Salem to Raleigh, North Carolina. Cleveland to Cincinnati, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio to Detroit, Michigan, Chicago, Illinois to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Nashville, Tennessee to Atlanta, Georgia, Scranton, Pennsylvania to New York City, Philadelphia to Reading, Pennsylvania, and a daily Amtrak Cardinal between Chicago and New York. On the 6th, Canadian National announced that it would be purchasing the Iowa Northern Railway. This deal is subject to approval by the Surface Transportation Board in the coming months. On the same day, the FRA announced research grants for nine more passenger rail corridors, those being Phoenix to Tucson, Arizona, Fort Collins to Pueblo, Colorado via Denver, Nashville to Memphis, Tennessee, Green Bay, Wisconsin to Chicago, Illinois, Milwaukee to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, Eau Claire, Wisconsin to Minneapolis, Minnesota, Chicago, Illinois to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and increased service on Amtrak's Pennsylvanian and Hiawatha routes. On the 8th, Amtrak's new look made its way onto a new engine ordered for work service. Previously only seen on the long-distance charger locomotives, the Phase 7 paint scheme was spotted on a new GP38 for Amtrak to use in work service. Also on the 8th, President Biden announced a massive funding package for rail-related projects across the country, totaling to over $8 billion in federal grants. Included is $1.1 billion to fund Richmond, Virginia to rally North Carolina passenger service, putting into motion a plan for an eventual Atlanta to DC high-speed rail. Speaking of high-speed rail, California High-Speed Rail and Brightline West received $3.1 and $3 billion respectively, and CSX was given $729 million to replace the Potomac River Bridge leading into Washington, D.C. Finally, Amtrak received a bunch of small grants, such as $143 million to start running a second Pennsylvanian between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, just under $50 million to upgrade Chicago Union Station, $34 million for Corridor ID projects, $27 million to upgrade the Downeaster's CSX-owned trackage, and a few smaller grants for random projects in Montana and Alaska. Overall, huge win, especially for those high-speed rail projects out west. On the 14th, a bull, now known as Ricardo, somehow escaped a meat processing plant and wound up on the train tracks in Newark, New Jersey. After being captured, Ricardo was sent to an animal sanctuary where he's reportedly doing much better. Just a few miles away, on the same day, Newark International Airport announced it would be redesigning its iconic air train, which in recent years has been showing its age. On the 15th, after more than 40 years of service, the Bay Colony Railroad ran for the last time, 
being taken over by the Mass Coastal. Luckily, two of the three remaining Bay Colony locomotives, 1705 and 1706, are supposedly being preserved by Mass Coastal, and as for 1701, it's being preserved by Mother Nature. On the same day, down in Mexico, Tren Maya, a new inner city rail service, opened between Campeche and Cancun. This new line, using modern Alstom train sets, is the country's premier rail line, and with plans to expand service further over the next year, Tren Maya will provide tourists and locals with an enhanced degree of mobility on the Yucatan Peninsula. On the 17th, an ex-Amtrak P40DC was spotted in a coat of red Kiwatan railway paint. Apparently, four of these engines were acquired for use on this Canadian railroad in northern Manitoba. Interestingly, the Kiwatan Railway is one of the few remaining mixed operators in North America, meaning its trains carry both passengers and freight. The next day, Norfolk Southern acquired 44 XKCS locomotives after months of being power short. In 2019, NS retired and sold off hundreds of locomotives, and now, five years later, it's seeing the effects of its short-sighted plans. These XKCS-9s were all originally owned by BNSF, hence their orange paint, but were sold to KCS and then NS, who patch renumbered them and then temporarily placed them into trail-only service. Soon, these orange Dash 9s will be rebuilt to AC-44s by NS, further standardizing their motive power fleet. On the 20th, after many years of development, California startup Parallel Systems released a video showcasing their autonomous rail cars and their ability to platoon with each other, running as one train. I've had my criticisms of Parallel Systems in the past, and I certainly will be criticizing them more in the future, stay tuned. But I have to say, this is pretty cool. On the 21st, Siemens Venture Cars finally entered service on the Amtrak San Joaquins. After sitting around awaiting modifications for a couple of years, these new cars are finally starting to run on this busy corridor. The next day, Amtrak submitted a request for a proposal for new bi-level train sets to replace aging superliners. As of right now, Amtrak expects manufacturers to submit proposals by May 18th and some point after that, Amtrak will choose a new manufacturer to design these trains. Interestingly, instead of opting for individual cars, it seems like they're going with train sets. On the same day, Justin Vonashek, the chief operating officer of Metro North, announced a contest for Metro North employees to design the paint scheme for a locomotive paying tribute to railroad workers. According to this post, this engine will feature thousands of pictures of railroad employees, so it'll definitely look interesting. Three days later, on the 25th, an Alstom promotional video could have accidentally given a sneak peek at what their new electric locomotives will look like. Toronto Commuter Rail Go Transit is currently in the process of electrifying its network, and by the looks of it, Alstom will be the manufacturer of their electric locomotives. With a look reminiscent of Trend Maya train sets, this is what these electrics could potentially look like. Obviously, this is just a video, and it might not be that deep, but if this is an official rendering, we'll likely receive more detailed information soon. Finally, into 2024. On January 1st, BNSF took over Montana Rail Link, a regional freight railroad previously leasing BNSF trackage in Montana. Now that Montana Rail Link is back under the ownership of BNSF, some of its engines have made their way onto BNSF's mainline network. Two days later, CSX released 1853, the New York Central Heritage Unit. For some reason, instead of using the New York Central's iconic font, however, CSX opted for Times New Roman. Who could have known that a locomotive could be an MLA format? On the 5th, California High Speed Rail advanced its plans to order its first high-speed trains, naming Siemens and Alstom as its preferred manufacturer for these train sets. According to this announcement, the first trains could be ordered as early as this year. On the 12th, after years of delays, Tri-Rail began service to Brightline's Miami Central Station in downtown Miami, also debuting a fresh new wrap design at the same time. This is big news for Tri-Rail, which for years has been stuck running to the airport on the outskirts of the city. On the same day, OptiFuel announced its plans to build a new line of locomotives known as Total Zero. These freight engines will run off renewable natural gas and will make 5,600 horsepower competing with traditional diesels. According to their press release, the first Total Zero locomotive will be completed in January of 2025 and will begin testing at the Transportation Technology Center in Pueblo, Colorado. Time will tell if RNG will be adopted by any railroads, but either way, it's cool to see another manufacturer trying to get into the mainline freight locomotive game. Finally on the 12th, Virginia Railway Express approved a multi-year investment plan to implement Saturday service, upgrade stations, and most importantly ordered long-awaited Alstom Karadia bi-level cars. 
A few years back, VRE released a video with renderings of these rail cars, but an order has yet to be made. On the 19th, Florida East Coast officially revealed its new corporate Grupo Mexico paint scheme. I previewed one of these locomotives in the shops a few months ago, but it wasn't until January that it saw the light of day. Additionally, FVC unveiled a locomotive paying tribute to veterans at the same time. On the 23rd, after receiving $3 billion from the Federal Railroad Administration, Brightline West was granted a $2.5 billion private activity bond from the U.S. Department of Transportation. Despite the fact that it's marketed as a privately funded high-speed rail project, at this point it's been mostly funded by the feds. Either way, this is really promising for Brightline West, which hopes to be fully completed in time for the 2028 LA Olympics. The next day, a brand new coaster cab car was spotted being moved to San Diego. These cars were originally planned to be delivered in 2022, but I guess better late than never. Staying in California, on the 25th, California High Speed Rail provided a first look at train interior renderings. While trains will obviously feature traditional seating, it looks like they may also feature a family area with places for kids to play, premium pod seating, and most interestingly, cocoon seating, which I would honestly love to experience for myself. The next day, CSX released another heritage unit, this time featuring the Monon's black and gold paint scheme. The next day, the Phoenix Valley Metro opened its Phase 2 Northwest Extension. Though it was originally planned to be opened in 2026, thanks to a proposition increasing local taxes, it was opened two years early. On the 29th, a third type of locomotive started wearing the Amtrak Phase 7 paint scheme, this time being a Genesis locomotive. P42DC number 174 was released from the Beech Grove shops sporting this fresh new paint scheme, and according to a Railway Age article, more locomotives are soon to follow. On the same day, CPKC revealed its fourth piece of hydrogen equipment. Joining the recently built Hydrogen AC44 is a tender which will allow for the easy refueling of CPKC's H20EL locomotives. Over the past few years, Canadian Pacific, now CPKC, has been leading the charge in developing hydrogen rail technology, and at this point, three locomotives, one tender, and likely more equipment has or will be built. On February 1st, the New York subway's new R211T cars entered service on the C train. Though they look identical to the existing R211s on the outside, these trains are the city's first to feature open gangway cars. Two days later, in an unprecedented move, the Federal Railroad Administration shut down the Blackwell Northern Gateway Railroad following a series of safety violations they discovered. As of right now, this line remains closed, with local customers urging the FRA to find a new operator soon. On the 16th, the LA Metro selected South Korean manufacturer Hyundai Rotem as a manufacturer for its new subway cars. This $663 million order calls for 182 HR 5000 cars to be completed by 2028, just in time for the LA Olympics. On the same day, Trinity Railway Express, a Texas-based commuter rail, announced its intentions to purchase up to 11 Siemens Charger locomotives to replace aging F59PH, F59PHI, and F40PH locomotives. As of right now, TRE plans to award an official contract this month with the first locomotives being delivered in 2026. The initial order calls for five units, but if the full options of the order are exercised, the railroad's entire fleet would be replaced. The next day, multiple photos surfaced of the first SC42DM locomotive being built for Metro North. This Charger variant will be the first ever dual mode, operating off both diesel and third rail. Supposedly, the first unit will be delivered in the next few months, and the first of these engines should enter service by the end of 2025. On the 12th, CSX released its third heritage unit of this episode, this time for the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac. Three days later, on the 15th, the California State Transportation Authority signed a deal to order an additional six hydrogen fuel cell trains built by Stadler. These trains will be used on the Sacramento to Merced Valley Rail and will enter service sometime around 2027. On the 20th, for the first time since September of 2022, the Seminole Gulf Railway reopened its Fort Myers line previously ravaged by Hurricane Ian. After a lengthy process of rebuilding its Caloosahatchee River trestle bridge, the Seminole Gulf will be able to stop loading its product onto trucks in Sarasota, once again restoring rail in the Fort Myers area. This is good news following the unfortunate demise of its sister railroad, the Bay Colony, in December. More interestingly, on that day, Ancora Holdings Group, a massive stakeholder in Norfolk Southern Railway, announced its desire to replace current CEO Alan Shaw with Jim Barber Jr., a former UPS executive, and to bring in Jamie Boychuk, a former CSX executive, as chief operating officer. 
They claim that NS is the worst performing Class 1 railroad due to poor management and too much focus on intermodal traffic, a segment with relatively small profit margins. If Ancora can win this proxy battle, not only will Norfolk Southern shift its focus from intermodal, the only rail traffic segment that's currently growing, but it'll also focus even more on short-term profits. Obviously, Norfolk Southern's current state is the result of years of cost-cutting and short-sighted decisions, but if Ancora's new management does take over, Norfolk Southern will find itself in a somehow even worse position. In better news, on the 21st, the Federal Transit Administration announced a $631 million grant funding a handful of transit projects east of the Mississippi. In Philadelphia, SEPTA received $317 million to replace all 25-year-old M4 rail cars on the Market Frankfurt line. In Baltimore, the light rail link was given $214 million to replace its entire 90s-era light rail fleet. And finally, in Chicago, Metro received $100 million to order an additional 50 Alstom Karadia bi-level cars, increasing the total number on order to 200. On the same day in Chicago, Metro used money received from a Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Grant to order Battery Electric Stadler rail cars. Currently, this order consists of eight two-car train sets with options for eight more trains and 32 trailer cars, making for three or four car train sets. The first trains will be delivered in 2028, entering service on the Rock Island District's Beverly Branch. This branch line only operates 16 miles between LaSalle Street and Blue Island, so not only will these cars not become a system-wide solution, but they'll only be used on a tiny part of a relatively low ridership line. On the same day, in a similar manner, Metrolink received a $59.3 million grant from the South Coast Air Quality Management District to begin testing zero-emission multiple unit trains. These trains, though not ordered yet, will be either battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell and will initially operate on the Antelope Valley Line. Additionally, Metrolink received $87.4 million to purchase Tier 4 locomotives replacing 12 aging MP36s across the fleet. This comes after Metrolink released a zero emissions technical analysis last summer that completely wrote off traditional electrification due to its high cost. Unfortunately, this means that Metrolink will become yet another railroad to try battery electrification instead of just doing the real thing. On the 26th, NJ Transit released a new wrap in celebration of Black History Month. For some reason, it was released just three days to the end of the month. On the same day, the city of Stewart, Florida announced that it would be Brightline's next stop with plans to build a station there in the near future. Finally, on February 29th, Metro North completed its fifth heritage unit commemorating the Penn Central. Similar to the Conrail unit, it features a bright yellow nose, and like the Conrail unit, I think it looks great. So that was December of 2023 through February of 2024. We had a bunch of really exciting things going on this past quarter, and as we transition into the spring, even more exciting news is on the horizon, so stay tuned for that and a few other exciting videos that are in the works. <laughs>